Hello friends and gamers, my name is Jinx, and welcome to a brand new YouTube War series where I play the board game Napoleon in Europe. This is going to be a solo play, but with heavy audience participation. By that I mean is that I'm going to be playing as the French Napoleonic Empire and the coalition forces, Britain and whoever Britain's allied with, the Austrians, the Russians, the Prussians, the Ottoman Empire, and the Spanish, those will be played by heavy audience participation. Of course, if things are slow or they need a judgment call, of course, I'll step in so that the game keeps on flowing. But I'm going to try to rely on the audience through their commentary, through their posts, as to what they think the coalition forces should do. Whether that means an uh, amphibious assault by the British in a certain port somewhere, or if it means that they want the political action points to be spent in a certain direction, or the production points to build certain amount of units in certain nations. I'll do my best to provide all this information to the audience as to what resources they have at their hand, or what units they have where, and the audience will do their best to kind of challenge Napoleon in his conquest of Europe. I think this will actually be kind of interesting too, because it will represent the the you know the the loss of cohesion they have between coalition forces where they couldn't quite coordinate whereas everything underneath napoleon was underneath his grasp and he was with some degree of of, of capability was able to <laughs> able to organize his forces across europe having the benefit of interior lines as well so we'll have to see how that goes it might be super clunky but it might be very enjoyable as well so if you're listening to this and this sounds something interesting to you please feel free to comment as much as you like and you can ask questions if i didn't cover certain things clearly enough to try to give uh, to get as much information and give me as much feedback as you think uh, you need. Um, uh, I need to uh, to launch your battles for you for the coalition forces. So I'm going to be playing with an amalgamation of different rule sets, so it'll get a little bit clunky for you guys. It'll be uh, a long time since I last played Napoleon in Europe, but there's some features behind it I didn't quite like. For the most part, we're following the rules as much as I possibly can, being rusty with it, but there's some things that are going to be slightly different. So for instance, tactical battles will be different. In the, the designers of this game, or the associates of this game, or something like that, designed another board game called Victory and Glory. Now, Victory and Glory, they uh, I believe it was a Kickstarter game, but they created a computer version of the game as well, which I thought was better than the actual physical board game that they ultimately did release. The physical board game of Victory and Glory... I thought it was uh, it was very it wasn't uh, it wasn't very much of a dice rolling game, whereas the computer game was much more interesting in my opinion. And one of the things they did in the computer game is they limited the amount of of units that could show up on each of these flanks. You could only have four units per each of these flanks, right? Each of these boxes. Whereas in the original rule set, you would have an, an unlimited amount in each one of these flanks, which I thought was somewhat ahistorical because you could really pile up a really strong right flank and bare bones on the left flank and really make it. Uh, really kind of unrealistic, whereas a general would be able to see displacement of the forces and be able to start piling stuff in there. So I think by limiting the amount to four per box here, it makes for a, more of an extended game, but also much more interesting to boot. So I really like that, and that's what we're going to stick with. There's another feature from Victory and Gloria we're going to pull in, and that is a mountain range between Switzerland and Tyrol. I like that quite a bit uh, because oftentimes Switzerland can be a bit more uh, of a super highway where all nations walk through that territory. And so uh, this way would uh, kind of limit its utility, especially since most conflicts in Europe go from east to west, so or west to east rather. Um, regardless, horizontally, <laughs> and therefore Switzerland becomes less of a passable route because of that feature there. So I like that quite a bit. Uh, in fact, too, if you look at the territories between Paris and Vienna, it's one, two, three, four territories, whereas if you block off Tyrol and Switzerland, you'd have to go uh, one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five, right? So it extends the distances a little bit in that regards. I think that's appropriate due to the mountains, right? So that works out. There's also been uh, several expansions or perhaps modifications to the original Napoleon in Europe. One of them I think was called Advance the Guard or Charge the Guard. And one of the features they did is they uh, they added a few extra anchor symbols. So let me just cover that quickly. You have in Anatolia, southern Anatolia here, you have the anchor symbol in Athens. You have one in Macedonia. You have one in uh, Venice over here in Naples. You have one in Milan here off the coast. You have in Gibraltar, it's its own little territory now with a with an anchor symbol there as well. You have in England, you have a couple here, I believe. Yeah, you have one in, um, hmm, I'm not sure exactly where that one is. I suspect it's Wales. Wales, then you have one up there in the Midlands. And working our way along the coast, we see up here in Pomerania, we see an anchor, and then southern Sweden, we see an anchor. So we got a few extra little anchors here and there to give more general flexibility on the map. And that's about it for changes and modifications. What rules we're playing with is advanced rule set, 
and kind of a historical setup and we have innovations here in play as well. So Austria-Hungary has a superior light cavalry screen which is started in 1796. Nationalism for France, levy and mass and light infantry tactics. So that's what's occurring right now. So we're playing in the 1796 start date. We put it to a vote on the on my YouTube page, and ultimately the decision was to play the scenario one with a fairly narrow margin, but that was the final vote on the matter. So let me just read the introduction on that event, and, and we'll see kind of what it's all about. So, 1796, the rise of Napoleon. A great military commander is about to walk onto the stage of history. Napoleon has just been given his first major command, the ragtag army of the French Army of Italy as it prepares to invade Italy. They have no shoes, no food, and no pay, but at least they are outnumbered. Historically, Napoleon led them to victory and began his meteoric rise to emperor. Can you win against the odds and build an empire? That's the intro. We're starting in April 1796. France is at war with Great Britain and Austria, who are allied. Great Britain moves first. However, Great Britain and Austria may not move during their first turn. This is meant to simulate the indecision about what to do next as to the fact that Napoleon grabbed the initiative. All parties begin with one political action point. Um, basically, only Austria, Britain, and France are active, although we can use our political action points to pull different nations into the mix. And that's about it. So uh, there'll be some features I'll kind of explain, maybe an odd modification or two I'll throw into the mix. But generally speaking, I think it's fairly straightforward. Without further ado, let's dive right into the event here, starting off with Napoleon. So I'm not going to film the entirety of the turn. I'm going to cut out and splice different sections together. So I cut out sections like, you know, reading the rules and reminding myself how certain features happen, uh, setting up the battle board and that kind of thing. I'm trying to kind of keep it condensed to a more entertaining degree. So you'll see some kind of editing in the background. So we're, our first battle, our first moves are going to be something like this. From Provence to Piedmont, we're going to send the entirety of these forces into that territory. I'm not sure exactly if I have to announce all my moves first or how it pans out. From this would be uh, Lorraine, yeah, Lorraine to Baden-Baden-Württemberg. We're going to send this attacking force, plus this attacking force is going to come in there as well. And then we're going to do some minor moves on the map later on. Afterwards, we're going to start to uh, try to send our naval forces here from Holland to join this force in Brittany. Except my belief is that in this Brittany force at this harbor here, we have access to two sea zones up here in the North Atlantic as well as in the Bay of Biscay. So by having four naval units over there, it might be a nicer position to have for ourselves. Okay, so that's what our actions are. Let's start off with the Battle of Piedmont. The Minor Battle of Piedmont. This is an attack by the French with Napoleon against the Piedmontese 3 Infantry. It's a minor battle, so you ignore all these, uh, these columns and consider it three long rows. So we start off with the cavalry phase. Our cavalry is going to have two action moves. So they're going to go here as one and attempt to attack that. The Austrians respond with squaring their units, and so the cavalry call off their attack. Now the enemy has no cavalry, so that turn is skipped. Now we go on to the artillery stage. The artillery get to roll two dice in attack. I don't know if we have a space for this in any kind of delicate way, so what we're going to do is we're just going to trust that I'm not going to cheat against myself and roll on the battle board here without doing too much damage to anything else, because my, uh, my rolling bin here is a little bit on the bigger side. And I would like to try to stay more focused on the battle map. So I will roll within here just to keep things constrained, but it might be a little bit off camera. So the roll we need to have, artillery is firing a distance of two, and so we need to roll a nine or a greater. Uh, in this case, so we are attacking at a unit in a square, so we get plus two. So nine or up using two dice, two dice six. Um, our results here are ten. That means we clearly win. We're attacking this guy in a square. So he's defeated. Let's see if he's eliminated or not. On a 1 to 3, he's eliminated. On a 4 to 6, he retreats. So this infantry retreats. Now, my thinking is I don't get a plus 2 <laughs> for the hit results. So he's just forced to retreat, and he's squared. So he retreats in square. And that takes care of my cavalry. Now my infantry, what they do is they're going to move up to engage the enemy. And I can't quite recall what the light infantry do just yet. So let me flip over to the other side. I think the light infantry are fairly straightforward, plus one on fire attacks, negative one to charge, when scoring a hit or being hit in a fire combat is less frequent, can avoid charges like cavalry. All right, so um, yeah, so they have less of a chance to hit against the enemy. Uh, does it show up here, light infantry at plus one? Okay, so we got a plus one to our fire attack, but this was their move, that's their only action they have. The two enemy Austrian uh, 
uh, units can fire back, and they're going to be rolling against. Can they roll against our cavalry, infantry against cavalry at an eight? So they're going to roll at an eight here. So here's a first roll, that is a very poor roll, and the second Austrian roll is a six, another quite poor roll. And that concludes that the Austrians decide to retreat at this point after the first round, and they give up the battlefield to the enemy with all three of their units retreating. And of course, we still get to pursue. So there's three units here that are going to be chased, and the pursuing cavalry can attempt to strike them. Um, actually, I could probably pursue with all my units. So one, two, three, four, five units pursuing. Sorry, we'll roll for the cavalry first. One dice for each. So here's the cavalry attempting to, well, I guess we're going against infantry. So uh, five and up. We succeed. We take off one unit. Uh, now we have some infantry. We have. What do we say? One, one, two, three, four, five. Five infantry. I don't know if the uh, light infantry counts. So there's four, with the light infantry being the white dice here. And we need to roll six and up. So we managed to succeed with one hit, it being a six. And so the final unit retreats safely to the adjacent territory. So there we have it. Maybe that wasn't the best choice for them to do, to retreat. Retreats can be quite punishing, but uh, they managed to retreat to a better position here in the nearby. Uh, Milan territory. The French have captured Milan. Now we turn our attention up north along this border here as we have a major push from Belgium as from Lorraine into Baden-Baden-Württemberg. So the battle of Baden-Baden-Württemberg is set up. The French are attacking the Austrians. So we need to roll when the reinforcements come in. We need to roll one dice and with high numbers for the French. Two. That means that the, the French are going to come in on round two. All right, now we have the placement of uh, train features. So we'll start off with the, uh, well, the Austrians will be uh, white and the French will be red here. So the Austrians have gotten nine. Nine is, uh, they get two special train and the French have gotten 10. So that means they get two special train as well. So let's roll first for the uh, French here. They have seven and this one is a six. So a seven, uh, a six is a woods. And a seven is a hill. So they get these two. Did I say the French first? I believe I did. Seven and six here. And then we have the uh, the Austrians. Same thing. We have a 10 and we have an 11. A 10, 11 is a village and a town. Uh, a village slash town. So the same thing. So we're seeing a very populated area. Now I'm going to, because I'm playing solo play, it means I'll... <laughs> Things will be a little finicky as I make adjustments and change things around on the map. Uh, uh, you know, after we place these down here, negative one fire into or from and cavalry charge into or from. So we're going to make the center point a strong point uh, with our with our. Actually, we'll make the flank here our strong point, and this here will be kind of our defensive flank on that side. So we'll make a strong push by the French on this side. Charging into will be difficult, but our artillery can fire out of. And because it's going to be a little harder to fire into here, we're going to just limit that with one infantry and make a strong left flank. On the opposing side, they not knowing whatsoever what's going on on this side, I'm going to make it somewhat random by rolling a dice. So um, that will be the the the, fo uh, the that will be the focus point of where the Austrians will put their attention to. One and two will be this flank. Three, four, five, six. 5-6. So they are going to be actually pushing on this side, not knowing whatsoever what the French are going to be doing. They're going to be pushing on the uh, on this flank on this side here. Um, so we're going to put our artillery in this position. Negative 1 fire into and from, negative 1 charge into. So we're going to put these guys here and we're going to make our strong position on the right flank here. Right relative to me. <laughs> and we're going to have a couple dudes on this flank so that they can move backwards if need be. Right, but that's the idea there. Okay, hopefully that works out because these guys can pull this way if need be, not knowing what's on this side. I mean, you could arguably have them here, but I think it's stronger to have them in this position on the opposite side of where you're at. The only the reason that we didn't do it this way is, well, because charging into it is a little bit more difficult over here. Okay, starting off with the French and their cavalry attack. Cavalry goes first. They're going to charge out of here and attempt to attack this flank here. Will they do that? 
or will they play defensive for the first couple rounds? Because that's also an, a, a decent tactic. They have two rounds before these French reinforcements arrive. They could play it initially defensive, and the Austrians could retreat at any point, so they might want to play defensive initially instead of risking attacks, especially in the face of negative one attacks here. But I still think they'll go for it, because they don't want the, the Austrians to retreat necessarily to, to combine their forces with what they have in the Hesche Darmstadt, so they're going to come up into this direction here. So they're going to attack and attempt to square the infantry. This infantry here has, a well, what, what are they looking at? They're going to be faced off against the, yeah, they're going to be faced off against the cavalry. The cavalry will be rolling plus two, um, and because they're heavy, they're going to be rolling a plus one. So plus three on that dice roll, whereas the infantry, uh, a plus two on the dice roll, the infantry would just be rolling. Yeah, so that's not great. That's really not that great. Um, they will square. They will square. I think that would be appropriate. Yeah. They will square and leave it at that. And now we have the uh, enemy cavalry. They're going to move out here and attempt to engage, or the Austrian cavalry. They're going to attempt to square these guys. Now, the difference there is a little bit more minuscule. Um, but the French are going to square. And that leaves the Austrians the choice of either pursuing their attack at a negative three. No, it's too too severe, so the Austrians won't do it. If the French hadn't have squared, then the the you know uh, the even attacking into the woods, they would potentially win the whole battle if they eliminated this guy or forced him to retreat. So by the French squaring, it prevented the Austrians from winning the entire battle by happenstance, by happening to win against that guy there. So that's the idea of why they squared. Okay, moving on from this point. Let's take a look at what the cannon are going to do. The French cannon here are going to fire at that squared infantry. So they'd be rolling a 9, but they're firing at a square, so they get plus 2, but minus 1 because of that. So they're going to be rolling an 8 is what they need to roll. Let's see if these dice play nice. And they manage to score a hit against the squared infantry. And the result is a 4, which is they force the squared unit to retreat out of the battlefield. Okay, now it's time for the Austrian unit. To fire at this uh, this guy here, same story, except they have negative one. Firing six, um, six, seven, eight. It would normally be a hit, but with this negative one, they managed to uh, to to miss that one. So no luck there. Now it's time for the infantry to do their moves. The other French are going to do a major push on this flank here, advancing everything entirely across the entire front, except this guy's going to move sideways. And so in this case, he's going to stay back, with the French hoping to win on the left flank and the right flank just holding on. Okay, now it's time for the Austrians to go. The Austrians on this flank are going to fire. Uh, they get a negative one to fire from, so they're rolling at a nine. Uh, sorry, they're going to be firing against the cavalry unit here at an eight. Uh, sorry, make that a nine because it's firing from a ten. And they miss. Then what else are they going to do? Well, this guy here is going to come across here. We're going to send in an infantry to the center position, and this infantry is going to move forward. Okay. I think that about covers round one. We drop this guy down to this one position here, and we open up with phase two, or round two. Starting off with this cavalry here. This cavalry is again going to square this guy. It's going to charge this unit. And at this point, this French guy is going to say, no, I'm not going to square. I'm not going to square this time. So it's going to be a dice off. So we have, <laughs> we have a dice off with the... the Plus two for the French, rolling the reds, and uh, hopefully that works out. Okay, yeah, because it's heavy cavalry, it gets well, plus two against infantry, plus three because it's a heavy cavalry, but plus two because it's into a town. All right, so plus two on the red dice, and the white dice are just going to be straightforward and simple. Attacking unit, cavalry, plus two. Defending unit, infantry against cavalry plus two. Who gets plus two? I'm assuming it's just going to be the, uh, I'm assuming it's going to be, yeah, anyways. Defending infantry. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Rolling the attack. So we see the Austrians doing quite poorly with the heavy cavalry winning out. And what the results are here is, uh, so uh, let's, five, Five. They lost by five or more. This guy is eliminated off the board. Okay. The Austrians get to charge again. In this case, this guy's going to say, yes, I'm going to square this time around. 
and now uh, this Austrian heavy cavalry is going to choose if he wants to pursue or not. He thinks he has enough weight behind him right now that he's not going to bother, and that ends the cavalry round for the French. The cavalry on this side are going to be faced with this attack here. They're suffering negative two in the attack. There's going to charge this guy here, and now the French. The French in this case are going to hold tough and see if they can fight this one out. So the Austrians are rolling white, the French are rolling great reds, the Austrians have plus one, and the the French have nothing, I guess. So this is five, six against four. So a result of two or less forces this guy to retreat. Right? Five, make sure I have plus one, eight, eight minus four, oh, as a result of four. So he's gone, I think. Hold on, let me count this out. Austrians rolled 7, make that plus 2, 8, 9. But minus 2 for the cavalry makes it back to a 7, but make that an 8. Whereas these guys have a 4. So yes, they lost by 4 more. This guy is eliminated off the board. All right, and now this cavalry has a second charge attempt. I think it's going to charge against this guy. That guy's squared. Is it going to press the attack? I think it's going to press the attack. I think it's going to press the attack. The Austrians are going to charge in, against those guys, but now this French guy has a, a plus three, uh, or has a negative three. Uh, sorry, the cavalry has a negative three against that, so uh, that's going to be severe. Never mind, we're not going to attack into that one. Now we have the artillery round. This artillery is going to fire at that squared infantry. So it's going to roll here. The French are going to roll, needing a roll of nine which they get, but now we have to calculate the modifiers. They have plus one, which makes it a 10, but plus two since firing at a square, 11, 12, but minus one for firing into a town. They still managed to hit him, and let's see what the results are. Five, he is forced to retreat, and the French win the battle. And that concludes it. I want to see what the Austrians would have done in this case if they would have been able to punch through there with their cannon firing. That would be, uh, what is that, uh, 8, 9, 10, but minus 1 brings it down to 9. The same results would have occurred, forcing this guy to either be eliminated or retreat, winning it for the Austrians. So perhaps the Austrians should have pressed forth their attack and managed to uh, managed to potentially uh, take out the enemy. But in this case, the Austrians are forced to retreat. They lost one unit eliminated, two retreated. There is uh, one eliminated French unit here as well. So it's been fairly tied, but now the, uh, the French get to press their attack. So they have one cavalry rolling. Uh, it's going to target the artillery, perhaps, because it's a retreating unit. So they need a five and up. Miss. Uh, sorry, a pursuing unit needs a three and up against the artillery. Yeah, against the artillery. And now we have all the infantry rolling there as well. So we have one, two, three, four. Four infantry rolling. A pursuit against the artillery, I believe. With four hits, I should have, I should have held back on that. So let's assume one of them was a success because all of those that have succeeded, wiping out the artillery, eliminating off the board, and now we have the remaining three infantry, one, two, three, rolling against the uh, infantry. One hit there. So that means we're taking off one unit. Let's take out this guy. Call it done. I'm not sure if I can target. I think it would be a little bit much, much if I could target, but there we have it. So the Austrians have lost three units. To the French one unit. So not not great for the Austrians, but they managed to fight another day with three units and a heavy cavalry surviving into the subsequent round. All right, moving back to the battle board, or to the grand board here, we're going to replace some things on the map here. The French are now in Baden-Württemberg, and then we have the, uh, the presence of the Austrian forces here in that position, which is not very many. It's like I said, uh, elite infantry, two regulars, and a cavalry. And now we go for what the French do next. So the French, because they won that battle, they get a political action point. We put that off to the side. And we're going to use our political action point to attempt to grab Baden, 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 Wittenberg and get it into our pocket so we can make more money in the subsequent turns. So we have to roll for how that battle, uh, what the, the neutral nation there does. Um, we roll a dice, and since we have plus two on our dice roll, we need to hit a five or higher to win that fight. Okay. Five or higher, so I'm going to roll it on the map itself. Let's see, is a good spot here. Six. So we succeeded on aligning this territory here, or annexing this territory for the French, increasing our income by two with no battles occurring. So that's really good. 
All right, so the French have increased their income by two bucks. It's not huge, but it's something. And now we go on to our other battles that we want to play around with. We have here the French are going to move from Paris to Picardia over here. This guy is going to hang, hang back over here. Yeah, and then these ships are going to break free out of Holland into the North Sea and attempt to go to Brittany. So we need to roll a dice. Uh, the, the dice we need to roll is three, four, or, or sorry, four, five, six to break free um, because we're coming out from a closed port. Let's see what the results are. Four, five, six to succeed. Sorry, I think it's intercepted on a four, five, and six. Sometimes the way they do stuff like this is a little bit deceptive because sometimes high numbers are good, sometimes low numbers are good. Yeah, when they will be intercepted on a three, four, five, or six. Okay, so we are intercepted as we exit the port. So we now have a naval battle. We have two French units here. Two dice versus two dice. Okay, for a naval battle here, let's bring it over to this side. And this will have some interesting mm -hmm. results. The British get a plus one. Um, we're not defending in a port. And you get plus one for every naval squadron in the area. Okay, so that ne negates itself. The British ultimately have a plus one. So the, the French are rolling the reds. The, the whites here are for the British. Let's see what the results are. So seven and six. There's no difference in losses here in this naval battle. The French get their plus one. Sorry, the British get their plus one. Makes it a seven and seven. So there's no difference in losses. Therefore, I think that battle ends inconclusively. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. There's no more battles that occur. I think we either share that position or we continue on until everybody thinks it's good. But I think the French are going to retreat from this position now, if that's right, hopefully, and retreat here to Brittany, come to this position here, to English Channel. Now they need to go through this position here as well in the North Sea with a battle of 2v2. Uh, let's see what the results are. We need to roll a 5 or 6 to be intercepted. So let's see what the results are. Six were intercepted again, and now we need to battle it out. So again, whites are for the co coalition, reds are for the French. So uh, red for the French, they have a result of 10 here, and the coalition has a result of 8 plus 1, makes a 9, the difference of 1. So the British actually are the ones that lose one force. That's kind of different, not quite, quite what we expect usually in this kind of game. The British lose one ship, and the French go into port over here, joining up there. So that's kind of different. All right, so I believe I've done that well enough. I think I've covered all my bases everywhere I wanted to go. Um, pretty happy with that for the most part. If you guys see any mistakes, let me know. Next up, we move the turn marker here to May. And on May, we start off with a British turn. The British have a sizable fleet here, two in the North Sea, two in the English Channel, in port, and one in the North Atlantic, two in Bay of Biscay, two in Gulf of Marseille. We have a small force here in Hanover, the rest in London, two infantry, one elite, one cavalry, and one um, artillery unit. They can amphibiously move anywhere. They have basically ships present. And we have, of course, the Austrian forces here in Hesse Darmstadt. We have something to the tune of, what is it? We have two infantry, one elite infantry, and one cavalry, heavy cavalry. Plus we have five infantry, uh, medium cavalry and an ar uh, artillery. The French are basically equally matched with, with the French having a slight superiority of numbers. Here we have four infantry, one cavalry, and one artillery against an equal amount of French forces. And plus they have a leader there with Napoleon. And then we have the forces here in Bohemia, whatever they want to do. We have two political action points, one for Great Britain and one for Austria. It takes two to try to sway one of these major powers into their camp. So that's kind of what's going on there. And that about concludes everything. So one last thing I need to review on is in regards to the advanced rule set with cards. Because I think I do get a card here after that battle. Um, I do get a card before my production turn. I won a major battle. Uh, okay, so I, I draw two cards for France. One is a random event. Make one of your regular infantry units and an elite infantry unit. And then I have an effect. So I'm going to keep that effect to myself. Although you guys, if you pause and review that, you'll be able to see what that is. 
I'm going to make one of my regular units there in, uh, not in Northern Italy, but the one in, yeah, actually, you know what? In Northern Italy, I'm going to make one of my regular units into uh, elite unit over here. Excellent. Uh, just to mark it up with Napoleon there. Expansion of the guard has been played. And now the coalition forces grab a card, gain to put two political action points because they're the loser in that battle. They gain two political action point, point uh, after they lost that battle. So that's pretty good. I'm going to give it over to the Austrians. So now the Austrians have three political action points, which is quite sizable. Now they can make a major move against uh, uh, one of the other enemies there. Um, and let me quickly cover how that goes. But the political action points, you have to spend to do a diplomatic overture here against a neutral minor nation, player nation, diplomatic overture here, neutral major nation. One of the seven takes two to do that, and you roll two dice. If the result is equal to the diplomatic rating between those nations, the attempt succeeds. So you could definitely start moving stuff in your camp. Let me show you the diplomatic ratings, and then whoever is playing or whoever suggests doing anything for political action points, that's scenario two. Scenario one is here. You can take a quick glance at what uh, the situation looks like for everybody. And we can take a look here and see the, the, let's see, the commitment rating is how much it takes to force them to quit the fight. But the diplomatic rating is what you need to roll as Austria. This number or less, I believe. Yeah, that number or less to succeed in swaying them to your cause. So at this point, Austria can go for Prussia or Russia to sway them to your cause. Um, rolling a five or less. I think France is in there because uh, for those games that are ahistorical. So that's the situation. So I suspect that would be a good course of action. Otherwise, a person can always try to annex some of this neutral territory to increase your income. Of course, there's a risk of um, there's a risk that they will revolt and you'll have a minor battle on your hand. But oftentimes, they don't spawn enough neutral units anyways to to make it into a major battle. So it'll be kind of interesting. Basically, if you roll it. One dice for infantry, and on a result of one to four, you get uh, that many infantry units. Five or six are ignored. Cavalry, I think you roll one to two, and that's how many cavalry units you get. And a zero or one uh, or one for artillery, you get artillery. Everything else is ignored. So very minor amount of units, but you could potentially gain some more territories here for uh, political action points. Did I get a political action point? I did, and I placed it here in uh, Baden-Württemberg. I was thinking also of seeing to uh, see if I could liberate this territory, but I think it took too much effort or too much resources to do that, so it wasn't worth the attempt. Because um, it's not an annexing nation. Hmm. If there was a control mark there, it is removed. Yeah, so I suppose I could do that over here using... Um, Region belonging to non-homeland after they lost a war. So they haven't lost a war, so I can't annex that territory. Fun, fun. I wonder if the enemy can collect income from that territory. I'll have to look into that. Anyways, guys, that's about it. That's the conclusion of the fight. The grand total casualties for this round have been uh, interesting enough. We've seen two Austrian casualties up here, another two in artillery in exchange for... Uh, what we see here. So quite a sizable win for the French, mostly in that pursue pursue phase. I think the pursue phase is a little bit too strong. One of the features I will incorporate for the, yeah, that I will incorporate is that actually the retreating unit should be able to roll as well. And I think the retreating unit uh, of cavalry units should be able to fight back a little bit just to show that, you know, you might not always want to retreat. So I'm going to do that now because I actually like that rule quite a bit. So the Austrian heavy cavalry is going to roll. It's going to target it's going to target uh, some of the infantry here on a roll of five. And we managed to take off one of the enemy pursuing us here, and so it's not horrible. So it kind of makes it detrimental. If you have a large cavalry force retreating, um, then you might not want to actually pursue because you might actually lose some of your units. So that's what the final results are there. Two infantry for the French lost in exchange for four Austrian, one artillery, and one British naval unit. <clears throat> Again, I need to double check on the rules to see if the, the French naval units can, after the conclusion of the battle, continue onwards, uh, or if they are frozen in place. And I suspect they can continue onwards because it's like a, a meeting engagement and they managed to slip by. That's it, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. And like I said, if you guys want to review um, and give me some thoughts and feedback on what you want the Austrians to do and what you want the British to do, then we'll proceed with that. Talk to you later. Cheers.